welcome to Miami Children's Museum's quarterly conversation. It's our 11th one that we have had, and we're excited to bring you this month's or this quarter's topic, Breaking the Glass Ceiling, Inspiring Girls to Lead. And specifically, we've chosen this topic because it is Women's History Month, and we need to continue to spotlight women of the past, women of today, who are doing wonderful things in our communities near and far. And I'll give you just a fun little fact as to why we need to have a Women's History Month and uh, a quarterly conversation such as this. Every year, we in the US, they release a um, list of the top 500 companies in the US. Um, and it's top 500 by revenue. And of these top 500 in 2023, so just last year, only 52 of them had women CEOs, so women leaders. Of these 500 companies in the US, only 52 were led by women. So that is why we are here today, because we want to inspire and encourage the next generation of women to be leaders and change makers and make an incredible difference in the world. Without further ado, enough of me chit-chatting. It is time to meet some incredible women that we have gathered here today to be on our panel and to share their stories with you and hopefully inspire girls to lead as our topic is all about. So first, we will have in alphabetical order, I'm adding to the spotlight, we have Brittany Bassant. And Brittany Bassant is the current president and CEO of the Miami Beach Chamber of Commerce. And in fact, a fun fact for her is that she is the youngest president and CEO of the Chamber's history. And she champions businesses and community pillars alike through building relationships, connections that contribute to the overall economic development of Miami Beach. So welcome, Brittany, to our quarterly conversation. We're happy to have you here. Next up, we have Heidi. Brewer. Now, Heidi is hailing all the way from Houston, Texas, from NASA. She is actually, is that the control room in your background, Heidi, I think? Yes. Excellent. So adding you to the spotlight, Heidi. Heidi is a flight director at NASA since 2022, and she's the leader of the mission control team in Houston, Texas, supporting astronauts on board the International Space Station. She has also supported 20 space shuttle flights as a team member of the shuttle control team. And she's also supported over 20 space uh, cargo and crew dragon, which is a really interesting thing. They want to know what the crew dragon is. Uh, missions to the International Space Station as a team member. So welcome, Heidi, to our quarterly conversation panel. Next up, we have Nicole Stoddard, adding to the spotlight. Hi, Nicole. Nicole uh, Stoddard has a PhD uh, in English, and she is a theater artist, educator, scholar, and writer. She is a professor uh, in the Departments of Communications, Media, and Arts at Nova South Eastern University, and she is the, also the founding artistic director of Thinking Cap Theater, which is a professional nonprofit theater company in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Welcome, Nicole, and thanks for being here. And finally, at the end of our alphabet, we have da, 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 Tracy Wilson Morning. Tracy Wilson Morning is a mother, a philanthropist or mentor. She is a designer, a broadcast journalist, a motivational speaker, and writer. Tracy founded in 2002 Honey Shine, which is a program that aims to encourage girls as they balance mind, body, and soul. She is also the founder and creative director of Love, which is a vacation everyday clothing line. So welcome, Tracy. 
So everybody in our audience, you can see here, we have gathered women from science, business sector, the arts, and also uh, from building the community relations and, and the nonprofit world as well. And so to begin with, we have this topic called the glass ceiling. And what is the glass ceiling? So I'm going to ask Dr. Nicole Stoddard to help us define what is a glass ceiling. Nicole. Okay, here we go. So the glass ceiling, which is the title of our panel today, right, it is a term that um, I think first needs to be understood within a much broader historical context that actually extends back thousands of years. So since ancient times, gender inequality, which is why a term like the glass ceiling exists, right? Gender inequality has shaped the division of labor, uh, both at home and outside the home in the workplace, um, particularly in patriarchal societies. So that sounds like a big word. What is a patriarchal society? It's simply a society that, that has been created uh, to put men in power. So in patriarchal societies, historically, for thousands of years, um, men have primarily held positions of authority of, or power. So for centuries, generation after generation has grappled with how to name and define this problem of inequality that has existed in the world. And so um, the term glass ceiling is one term that has arisen for us to um, conceptualize what this means. The term actually um, first arose in the early to mid 1980s at a time when large numbers of women had entered the corporate sector. So think Wall Street, finance, maybe you have a parent or a, a, someone you know who was an accountant, um, where women had historically encountered difficulty um, obtaining anything more than say an entry level position or a, a middle management kind of position, but women were not being promoted to um, upper management positions or senior positions at the same rate as men. So there was a journalist uh, in 1984 who actually was the first person to put this into print in a publication called Adweek. This person's name was Gay Bryant. And from there, the term just flourished. It took hold and there were countless news articles, academic articles and books that were written. So by the early nineties, there was actually a presidential commission that was formed to try to spearhead this issue, um, not just with regard to gender, gender inequality in the workplace, but also with regard to racial inequality in the workplace. Um, there's a much more recent book called The Glass Ceiling in the 21st Century, which tells us that this is still something that we're grappling with four decades after the term uh, was first coined. Um, and the authors have a really good definition that I'm going to share with you, because the glass ceiling is, after all, a metaphor, right? So their definition helps break it down into its component parts. So the word ceiling implies that women encounter an upper limit on how high they can climb within an, an organizational ladder, within the hierarchy of any kind of business, right? Whereas glass refers to the relative subtlety, right? Glass we can see through, the transparency of this kind of barrier that exists. So it's there and we feel it, but we can't see it. Um, so although the notion of the glass ceiling is a metaphor, for the people that experience it, it feels very, very real, it's deeply felt. Um, so despite the, the term being 40 years old, everyone here today is going to share some um, meaningful insights into how they have experienced this and how they have also worked to overcome it. Excellent. Thank you, Nicole. I really appreciate that. Um, so to our panelists, let's start with Brittany. The question is going to be for all of you the same. How in your field, in your lifetime, do you think you have punched up and shattered that glass ceiling that's been above you. Brittany. 
Absolutely. So before I start and answer that question, I just want to say thank you so much to Miami Children's Museum for hosting this panel and for fostering these conversations. I think it's extremely important. And the fact that we are engaging with our younger generation is incredible. And to everyone that's here and taking time to listen to this, welcome and thank you so much for being here. It's a very important conversation to have. So as you heard a little briefly in my um, in my introduction, I, I am the youngest president and CEO for the Miami Beach Chamber of Commerce. Um, but before being the youngest president and CEO for the Miami Beach Chamber of Commerce, I was the youngest president and CEO for another chamber in the south part of the county called Chamber South. Um, so it was very, I, I'm not shy about it. I was very, very, very young when I started in this role. I was 28 years old when the Chamber of Commerce approached me uh, to Chamber South approached me to run their chamber. And I really don't consider that a glass ceiling moment because they 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 came to me, they approached me. So it wasn't really like I was shattering glass ceilings and, and breaking through barriers because I was approached based on the work that I had done in the community. But when I showed interest in the role of the Miami Beach Chamber of Commerce and I started reaching out to some friends and colleagues that I had, and I'm a new president and CEO in this role, I just started last September when I started reaching out. Um, Miami Beach is a very interesting place and it's, you know, it's an island, you know, there's a bridge to get here. And so it can feel very disjointed from the rest of Miami-Dade County. And it can feel a lot of the times it's a huge on tourism and hospitality. So it's very diverse and the landscape's very vibrant and beautiful in that way. But the local um, residents that live here are a very sort of set in their ways. And so when I reached out to a lot of people saying, hey, I'm interested in, in pursuing the role at the Miami Beach Chamber of Commerce as their president and CEO, I was told multiple times, "We, you would be amazing. We would be so lucky to have you, but you were never going to get that job. And there is absolutely no way that they're going to hire a young woman of color. I was not born and raised in the United States. I'm an immigrant. I, uh, I moved here from Trinidad when I was 14 years old. And regardless of the fact that I had run another chamber of commerce for six years, that I was very successful, that I have an incredible reputation in the community, everyone told me, you're not going to get the job. Um, and so it was a little discouraging, but at that point, I already submitted to my application and gone through the process. And so I continued down that path and, and ultimately and got the got the position and got the role. And I'll never forget, I'm not going to say who said it, but one of someone who's very, very important, influential on the beach here and in a leadership role as well, is also a woman. She came up to me and she said, I'm so happy that the chamber and the community had the courage to make the right decision. Um, so I do believe that was my glass ceiling moment because it, it is an interesting thing to, to see someone like me running a chamber of commerce from Miami Beach. And I think it just shows how forward thinking and forward moving the city is becoming. And I'm excited to be a part of that change and to continue to shatter glass ceilings throughout my career. Amazing. Thank you, Brittany. I feel like I can give <laughs> Of applause for your story. You know, you, I, there's, I know there's a Zoom icon that does this. <laughs> but thank you, Brittany. Let's move on to Heidi, just because you're next in the square. Heidi, can you tell us how you think you've shattered the glass ceiling in your field, in your career, in your life? Yes. From my perspective, I came from a STEM background. I went to school for aerospace engineering, which is a highly male dominated area. And so uh, throughout school, once I made it to college and kind of going through all my courses and the classroom, uh, it was largely male dominated. I you know, might have been the only female, especially as I got further and further along in my degree. And so with that, uh, there is a feeling of isolation, I think, to some extent, just because uh, I'm different than others. And so it took me a while to find a study group and to kind of settle into everything. Uh, secondarily, after graduating and then going out into the field, even as I was going through interviews and trying to find the job that I wanted, in one of the places that I interviewed, as I was walking on a tour, they actually, I had someone walk up to me and say, you don't look like an aerospace engineer. And it's just these little microaggressions that you get, um, you know, as you're trying to do something maybe that's a little different than what people are expecting, that you have to look past and, um, and, you know, go for your dreams anyway. And so fortunately, I have found at NASA, in general, we have a number of 
powerful women that are at high ranking positions. Uh, even our center director here is a woman, but uh, having to sort of make it to the point where I made it to NASA and I've been able to be, you know, in a leadership role that is typically not seen as a woman's role uh, within the control center and, and make it to my position is my glass ceiling moment. So basically that entire evolution of going through engineering school, you know, being one of the only females in, in a particular department, being told you don't look like an engineer, um, and then, you know, starting out kind of as a quiet personality and getting more confidence in myself and my capabilities and what it was that I wanted to see happen at NASA and bringing that forward and actually making it to this position that was my dream job since I set foot at Johnson Space Center. Uh, that was my glass ceiling moment. Wow, oh, thank you, Heidi. I can, I feel like round of applause for you. Um, Tracy, you're next in my uh, Zoom squares. Tracy, could you hear um, what you think your glass ceiling moment is? You know, it's interesting listening to everyone. First of all, I uh, echo what Brittany has said too. Thank you all. What an honor it is to be here um, and to be with this amazing group of ladies. Yeah, I was sitting here I, ever since we started this conversation a couple of weeks ago about the glass ceiling. I remember when you were talking about the 80s and that term coming out and discussing that with my mother. And, you know, my mother was in entrepreneur, even though I don't know that she would say that uh, she had her own cleaning business, she cleaned houses. Um, but it was, I, I feel like the glass ceiling has created in me that entrepreneurial spirit, like that, that not wanting to uh, just fit in with someone else, just okay, if you're not going to welcome us, uh, I'll create it myself, you know, I'll make it happen myself. And I feel like I don't know that I've had like that glass ceiling moment, because I feel like it's something we're always pushing against or trying to push through. Um, but I've had uh, really great moments of knowing because there were obstacles there or because there were um, you're being told you can't or you're or you shouldn't. Um, I've had that mindset to just create it myself. And I think, you know, Honey Shine is an example of that, you know, creating the mentoring program for girls. It was because I knew not all young girls had the opportunity that I had by having the mom that I have like that provided that example of just pushing through and not giving up. And regardless of what happens, that's uh, honey shine must be my, my moment of pushing through because, you know, we've been doing that over 20 years now and it started out in this community. And it was because I wanted young girls to have that drive and that opportunity that I had been given uh, and to stand in my truth and to walk into any room you know, knowing who I am and uh, not waiting on someone to give me permission to be who I was born to be. So I guess, I don't know if that answers the question, um, but I've always tried to look at life. I remember it clearly in the 80s, that glass ceiling term, but I always looked at it like, I know that doesn't, they're not talking about me. That doesn't apply to me, you know, having that type of uh, energy and attitude, which is uh, what both Heidi and Brittany have spoken of uh, themselves with having the courage, like, I'm not going to wait for you to tell me that, you know, I can do this when I know um, I can stand in my truth. Yeah. Thank you, Tracy. Yeah. I don't Thank know. you. Applause. Nicole, can you talk about a little how you think you've broken the glass ceiling in your um, field? Just make sure you unmute. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So, um, for me in the world of professional theater, um, also coming from an academic background where I've done a lot of research, um, uh, for at least 20 years, I've been very aware of the long history of gender inequality in the performing arts, um, you know, from ancient times until the age of Shakespeare in the 1600s, all plays that were produced were written by men and, um, uh, female roles were performed by men. Um, that didn't really start to change until the late 1600s. And so when you move to modern times and you look at the theater field, you know, if you want to be in a leadership position, if you want, to, which directing is a, is a leadership position, or if you want to run a theater organization, historically um, artistic directors and directors and playwrights that have been produced have all been men. Um, 
for decades throughout the 20th century and still largely to this day that there have been years where there have been exceptions. Um, Playwrights produced that are female have been in the 20th percentile, sometimes getting to the 30th percentile, and those stats apply to um, artistic directors and directors as well. So for me, you know, a lot of times you have to have experience that jobs will say, we want you to have X number of years experience before we will hire you. Well, if you haven't had the opportunity, if the opportunity has not been there, if you've not had access to the profession, um, how, how do you do that, right? So what you have to do sometimes, and what I did, um, is be entrepreneurial and pave your own path. And so I founded Thinking Cap in 2010, um, the company obviously now 14 years old. And I did that so that I could, could create a home for myself creatively and so that I could create a mission that prioritized um, gender equality and the plays that we program each year. We've never had a season that we didn't have an equal number of male and female playwrights. And so that I could um, also empower other women, um, hiring women, not just on stage and fantastic roles, but also off stage, um, working in all sorts of capacities as designers and stage managers um, and directors. Uh, so for me, and it's been really a matter of doing a lot of research and a lot of training and paving my own path, starting my own company. Thank you, thank you, Nicole. Now to anybody who is um, listening, watching along, if you have a question, you can pop it in the chat we, to any of the panelists or the panels, panelists in general. Um, you can put it in the chat or you can raise your hand. I know we have a couple of classrooms there I can see. Um, if you have questions, um, fire away as well. So as um, we see if anyone live has questions, people who registered also uh, submitted some questions. So I wanted to ask um, a couple of these. One is um, about, uh, let me see here, encouraging girls who are on the shy side. I think there is an assumption that, um, you know, to lead or to um, break the glass ceiling or to progress in a, in a career or an area, you need to be, um, you know, outgoing, but have that are shy and that need to have maybe that little encouragement. What in advice do you offer either parents, um, teachers, educators to who have uh, girls in their life who are, are shy? Or um, if there is a shy, a young shy girl listening in, what advice do you have to them? And panelists, feel free just to raise your hands and I, I can um, ask you to, to answer that. Tracy, was that a hand? Sure. Yes, that's a hand. <laughs> I was actually scratching my face, but yes, oh. that's my hand. <laughs> no. um, you know, when it comes to, I, I spend a lot of times with, uh, time with young girls and, and kids, boys and girls too. And I find that the whole shy uh, aspect, and I know from my experience too, was not truly understanding how powerful I was or how important I was or, or not believing it. You know, I think we can also call it the imposter syndrome as well, where we feel like we're not uh, worthy or, you know, not deserving or you know, if we speak up, something negative may happen. I think it starts with changing our mindsets. First of all, if I call myself shy all the time, or if that's a word that I would use, I would stop using that word. I would stop describing myself as such um, and start describing myself how I would want to be and how I would want to show up, even if it's just to yourself, you know, until you get to a place where you can express that out loud, start speaking it that life into yourself, who you are, you know, you are strong, you are powerful, you are meant to have a voice, you are here for a reason, you know, and um, that's important to know that. And I, that's whole self-esteem piece, I think ties, you know, into a lot of that. If we truly knew who we were and um, knew that we were very special, that's how God made us. I think that would um, help a great deal. I know that has been 
always helpful for me. And it's helpful in having those discussions with the kids that I work with. Like in the beginning of camp, they can come in and be very introverted and shy. And by the time they're telling themselves uh, who they are and what they're born to be, they are the the boldest and the, the loudest uh, and the most positive at the end of summer. So that would be my recommendation. Tracy, Brittany, I see your hand. So I think it then incredible words from Tracy. I think it's really funny how you asked this question about like, what if someone's shy? And we all sort of took a minute. I mean, so even panelists can be shy too, right? We all sort of took a minute and we're like, oh, who's going to raise their hand first? Poor Tracy scratched her nose and then she gets cold <laughs> on. Um, so careful. <laughs> that, everyone, I think everyone's felt that, right? Everyone's felt that feeling of being a little bit shy, being a little bit afraid to speak up or to say something. Um, but remembering that you can be shy, it's okay. And like Tracy said, speak, speak it into, into life that you're strong and powerful and believe in yourself, believe in the value that you bring to the table and believe that you can, you can transfer that to other people. And the only other thing that I want to say for anyone who's shy, smiles are contagious. And if you smile at someone, they will smile back. And that is a very easy way to just sort of break the ice and maybe even bond over the fact that, you know, it may be a little intimidating to strike up a conversation or to be shy or to to take a leap or to do something, but know that everyone, everyone goes through that. What you're feeling is not, um, is not something that everybody doesn't deal with as, as evidenced by what we just experienced here on our own panel. Great. Um, Heidi or Nicole, would you like to add to that or we can move on? Yeah, Heidi, go for it. One additional comment uh, regarding being shy. I was very quiet as a child and growing up, and I never would have guessed that I would become the leader of the flight control room at NASA. Uh, but through practice, and I think, you know, for, for those that are shy, that maybe are a little bit uncomfortable speaking in front of other people, one of the ways that you can get more comfortable with it is by finding something that you feel really passionate about. And it's something that it has so much meaning to you that you almost can't keep it to yourself. And it, from that, as you continue practicing and you try to do it, it becomes more natural to you. Uh, so I think you can kind of lean into yourself and really once you know yourself and, and what's important to you, communicating that out to other people becomes a little bit more uh, comfortable for you just because it's something that uh, is coming from inside you that that you don't have to think very hard about um, and that is important for you to communicate with others. Great. Thank you, Heidi. Um, okay. Nicole, do you have anything to add or we can move on to another question? Um, I would just second what Heidi said. I mean, even though I, I work in the performing arts, I am a behind the scenes person, not a front of front stage person. So for me, doing this work and being in a position of leadership and advocating for others, it's really the mission that drives me because I would definitely consider myself to be a shy person. And so um, I've put myself in a position where I have to constantly face that that fear and I have to con I have to think about why I'm doing it. Um, and hopefully something that is far more important than um, my own shyness about you know, public speaking or whatever the case may be on any given day, so. Finding that passion, yeah. So a question that we had pre-registered um, is, have you ever faced um, discrimination in your lifetime based on your gender? Um, and how did you overcome it or combat it? I see you all have thinking faces on. <laughs> Heidi, let's start with you. Yeah, go for it. I'll offer an example from um, earlier in my career uh, at one of the places that I worked. I um, I felt really passionate about a particular project and I had been working on it for a very long time. And uh, for whatever reason, my management was thinking about reassigning it to someone else. And I went in and I gave them all the reasons why I wanted to continue working on the project. And, uh, and then I was told that I was being emotional about it and that I needed to let the project go. And I took that really personally. And I kind of thought about it and wondered, you know, how many other people on the team that I was working in would they have said that to? Is, is it something about me or is it something about being female? I never really found the answer to that. But ultimately, in response, I continued going back and giving them all the technical reasons why I wanted to keep working on that particular project, uh, just because it had so much meaning to me and it was something that I felt was good for my leadership development and my technical development. And so, 
Uh, not to necessarily say always argue with your bosses, but I think it's a good example of one advocating for oneself and going in and making sure that you're really expressing yourself clearly. And even if someone says something to you that is hurtful or a little bit confusing, uh, that you still stand up for yourself and have that confidence to go in and, and ask for what it is that you think you deserve, or at least try to argue for it. Uh, just because Just because someone says something a little bit crazy doesn't mean that you have to give up. Great. Thank you, Heidi. Does uh, another panelist have an example of um, discrimination? Uh, Brittany? Uh, yes. So discrimination, you know, it's interesting. But um, what I did want to mention, and it'll tie in, is so today is March 13th. And yesterday on March 12th was Equal Pay Day. Um, so not to bring another sort of issue with our glass ceiling, we're talking about breaking glass ceilings, but you also, I, I don't think you can talk about breaking glass ceilings without addressing sort of like pay gap and, and what that means. And so the reason that March 12th is equal pay day is that on average, women make 84% um, of what a man would make for the same job. So they're getting paid $100, women get paid $84 for the same role, same job, same everything. And the reason that March 12th is equal pay day this year is because that's the amount of time that it takes a woman to catch up to the pre the, the wages that someone made the year prior. So a man you know, makes a wage during the year 2023, and then we have to work till March 12th um, of 2024 to-, to... So it takes uh, like two and a half more months, basically, right? Absolutely. A year and two and a half months for women yes. to make the same as a man would make in one year. Absolutely. Um, and so I think that that's just, I I face that. You know, I, I really never understood, or not never understood, I never experienced that sort of pay gap disparity until I moved to Miami Beach Chamber of Commerce. And when I got, when I was given the job and I got the offer letter and I saw, and I did my research and I knew what I was getting myself into and I knew the numbers um, I saw, I saw it very blatantly in front of me. And so what I did was I fought for it. I knew my value. I knew my worth. I know my value. I know my worth. And I wasn't afraid to fight for it. And I wasn't afraid to be vocal. And I wasn't afraid to potentially lose the opportunity to stand by what I knew was right. And so it's not always going to be easy when you're facing either discriminations or situations where you can choose between what is easy and what is right. And a lot of the times what's right is not always the easiest path, but you have to be willing to be firm and stand in those morals to, to ultimately succeed in the long run. Yeah, great. Thank you for sharing that insight and then your, your personal story <laughs> as well. Um, Tracy. Yeah, I, you know what? I'm so proud of both of you ladies. You know, I of all of you, you know, when I think of, you know, having to stand up for yourself and we describe it as having to fight or having to, you know, go to battle. And I'm my nature, I'm an emotional person. I I don't know if the, the majority of women, but I can you hurt my feelings. I can get my emotions about it. And I think with when it comes to uh, what we're discussing, taking our emotions out of it um, is very important. Well, and, and I don't mean taking them out of it, not letting our emotions lead uh, is very important and truly going in knowing what you're worth and knowing your value and what you bring to the table and Brit what Brittany said, you know, where you have to be okay to walk away because, you know, for far too long, and I can say this because I've done it, where I've played small in thinking that I will just, okay, take what is given and accept, okay. You get to a place where that affects your health, that affects you mentally, physically, emotionally, all of that. So having the courage to stand up and say, no, this is what I deserve and I'm not settling for less, you know? And and compromising, that's what like we do in life. But when it comes to your value, I would just encourage all of you never compromise on that. Know your worth and and stand in that. And anyone or anything or any situation that doesn't meet you at that place, let it fall to the side because the next is is where you're supposed to be. The best is yet to come. I'm a true believer in that. Thank you, Tracy. Nicole, mm -hmm. do you have an example of a time you faced discrimination? 
Um, I mean, I can think of many, unfortunately, and I, I would say, um, as some others have said, that the most important thing to do is to express yourself. Um, if you feel that there is an injustice happening, if you if you are aware of pay discrepancies between you um, and male counterparts, you you should not swallow these um, situations when they come to you. You shouldn't act impulsively either. Uh, but I think the more that we call out these kinds of experiences when the hap they happen, the more that that we have solidarity uh, as women and all people, uh, really, we should be advocating for, for pay equity, right? So it's really, it's it's knowing that it's okay to speak up and to address um, pay inequality whenever you find that you are um, experiencing it and not just letting it, letting it continue to happen. And advocating- I would like to add- oh. yes. No, go for it. Excuse me. I would like to add to what Nicole is saying, too. Uh, and I know there are young men that are listening as well. We need you to speak up. We need you to to uh, say something when you see something as well, you know, because this history of inequality when it comes, you know, to uh, pay and to work there, the men have been knowing that this has been happening you know, and they're not speaking up. We need you all, we need that next generation to speak up. Speak up for the young lady next to you. you st start now in school. You know, when you know it's not right, you know she's qualified, you know she's um, good at what she does or and she's deserving. Say something, speak up. You know, we and I feel like in so many different instances when people are doing things by themselves, um, it takes longer than it really should. You know, this is not just a, a conversation about women uh, not being paid um, equally. These are moms. These are leaders of families. These are, um, they're the ones taking care of you. So I would just encourage our young men too to be an advocate and, and speak up, use your life um, uh, to do that because, you know, Moms matter, you know, women matter, girls matter, um, and uh, having men with us on this journey, supporting this matter as well. So Tracy, you literally just beat me to my next question was like the advice for the for the young men, right? And and so that we need them as advocates. We need them as allies. Um, whether it's in the professional world at a school level and so forth. And I was just wondering if any of the other panelists have advice for um, parents of, of young boys. Um, if we have any young men um, watching and tuning in, what do we, how do we encourage them to be allies and to be advocates um, to, to the, the girls and the young women around them now and in the future? Any thoughts on that? I don't think we can we can say it better than Tracy, honestly. Yeah. yeah. I think it was so impassioned and it was so perfect. It's exactly, exactly what I would have said. Excellent. And I'm a mother of two boys. I have a daughter too, a boss. She, I call her, she's my boss. Um, uh, and I have two boys. And what we talk about all the time, and I have to, and their sister's been a, a great uh, example of this for them. My recommendation is treat her like a lady all the time, even when she's not acting like one, even when she's not behaving like one, you know, when my daughter, you know, remember, she's a lady, treat her uh, like a lady, no matter, walk away if you need to, but what have you, don't step outside of yourself of being a gentleman, of being respectful because of how, however, uh, she's responding. So this is that that's my what the conversation that I have with uh, my boys as well. And that started with their sister when she was being a, a, an older sister or a younger sister bratty to whomever. Just at the end of the day, just always remember, treat her like a lady. That no matter no matter what, if you need to walk away, 
stay and tr stay true to that gentleman that you you are as well and you do that by being respectful um and uh to two women and and speaking up and and you know walking away if you need to oh, great um nicole i know that you have a son a 13 year old um can you share a little bit about you know advice or parenting him to be um, an advocate to his sisters and and uh, yep. you know classmates. So I, you know, as as an educator um, for the last twenty years, I have periodically um, asked my students if they identify as feminists. I don't know if that's something that we can do now, but I was doing it twenty years ago, fifteen years ago, ten years ago. Uh, so I've always been on a mission to. Uh, help young people define the term because it's a term that has a lot of baggage. Uh, it's existed for a hundred years or so, and um, there's not a single definition for it that that everyone is is taught. So we 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 come at it with our own sort of preconceived ideas of what it means. But for me, with my son from a very young age, I have tried to teach him that it is. An important word and um, in its simplest, purest, and most, I think, useful sense is a term that is about advocating for equality for all people. Um, so I think, you know, equipping more young people um, and young boys in particular with a definition, a, a working and useful definition um, of this term is, I think, key to creating a generation that can can use this term and in actionable ways um, to make the world a better place for everyone, right? It's it's it really is. I think it starts at home, and so so being a feminist means um, treating everyone equally and treating them well, regardless of their gender. Great, thank you, Nicole. Um, Moving on to the next question, again, if anybody has um, any questions or something prompts them um, who is listening in, feel free to, to pop that in the chat. Um, I was wondering um, about, um, well, just in general, we have a question about your jobs and what you do and to speak to some of your favorite, uh, favorite part of your job and a least favorite part of your job. And that's a question that we had registered earlier. So um, Heidi, do you want to start? I see you in my middle square, I went straight in. <laughs> sure. Uh, my favorite part of my job is that my job is different every day. Um, and to just elaborate a little bit more on what a flight director is and, and what a flight director does, um, I work at NASA and we fly various space missions. Right now we have um, a number of astronauts in space right now on the International Space Station. And my job is um, similar to, I guess, what you would consider like an orchestra conductor. I'm the orchestra conductor in all of the different flight control positions that are watching uh, data that's coming down from the spacecraft are kind of working together so that we can support the astronauts as they do science in space. And so on some days, it might be more important to get the experiments done. And on other days, we might have maintenance that's taking place on board. Uh, similar to an old house, the space station has been in space for 25 years. And so uh, sometimes we have to fix the toilet. Uh, and so anyway, we work together on various different timelines and are working on these various uh, experiments and things as the astronauts are working. And so each day when I go to console, it's a different day because we have different timelined activities. Um, in the office, I get to study a lot of different technical materials and kind of learn a little bit more about the systems that are used on the space station. And then I go to classes and learn how the astronauts respond to emergencies um, and also just learn a little bit more about the various systems. The other thing that's really exciting, and this is really applicable to the younger generation, so the the younger students that are tied in right now is we are planning to go back to the moon and we're planning to go to Mars. And so I also get to work on projects that are looking forward to our missions that are gonna be taking place in the next five, 10, 15 years. And it's really exciting to see the places that we're going to be going for all humanity, um, you know, as NASA. And so all of those things rolled up together. The fact that it's different every day, you know, I get to work with astronauts, I get to work in teams, I get to learn about the ongoing space station as well as our future programs it really motivates me every single day to get up for work. Great, 
And is there a, do you have a quick least favorite job or you shouldn't say it? <laughs> Uh, there's not really a least favorite job, but I would say that because we are 24-7, 365, the space station is always in space, I sometimes have to work the overnight shift. And so I have to adjust my schedules and I go in around midnight and work about nine hours before I um, step off and, and get to sleep and, and we'll come back and do it again for the next couple of days. So I guess uh, staying up all night is a little rough sometimes, but because it's so exciting to do what we do, um, it, it makes it easy to get up anyway. Heidi, just a quick question from one of our um, viewers there. I would like to know uh, where you graduated from. Um, I graduated from Harrison High School in Marietta, Georgia, and then I went to Georgia Tech and got an aerospace engineering degree there with a minor in music. And then um, I did a second degree after that at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in uh, space studies and human factors. And that's uh, just the learning a little bit about the connection, I guess, between engineering and psychology and how we do decision-making and work in teams. Great. Thank you, Heidi. Um, somebody else to share with us what their favorite and least favorite parts of their job. Brittany, you want to go? Yes. So similar to Heidi, um, my job is different every single day too. And I'm one of those really annoying people that I'm like obnoxiously in love with what I do. Um, I've done it for a very long time now and I, I can't see myself not doing it. So a chamber of commerce is a really interesting place. Um, we foster economic growth and prosperity and we do it through leadership, networking, advocacy, and philanthropy. And so you think about that. There's leadership, there's networking, connecting with other people, there's advocacy, working with our local government to ensure that the right bills and, and legislations moving through and um, improving our community. And then there's philanthropy. So I get to do a little bit of everything every single day. And I love it. Um, I get to work on the business side. I get to work on the government side. I get to work on the nonprofit side. I get to be really active and involved in our community. I get to be surrounded by amazing, incredible people that all want to give back and help and impact change and make a difference. So I absolutely adore it. Um, for someone like me, I, I love the fact that I never know what my day is going to be like. Um, actually, I just got something notified to me that I have to run over to City Hall as soon as this is over, which is exciting for me. I, I love that. So I'm going to go chat with some of our city commissioners, make sure that we're staying on top of what's happening locally in our government here at Miami Beach. Um, the least favorite part is that sometimes you can get bogged down with some of the bureaucracy or the red tape that we have in government. Um, sometimes there's a lot of hoops that you have to jump through, a lot of rules and regulations, and it can sometimes um, slow down progress. We have to make sure that I have a board of governors that I report to, and we have to just sort of go through some of those, which is very important, right? Policy and procedures and following the rules is very important, but sometimes it can slow things down. And when you have a lot of momentum and you have a lot of excitement and you want to get something done and it's great, but you just have to sort of go through that process, that could be a little... Um, it's just, the, just not not the most fun. Um, but ultimately, every single day I get to wake up and ask myself, like, how can I make the community better? What can I do, not just for the city of Miami Beach, but for Miami-Dade County and the region as a whole? And my job is here to help other people connect them and build a better, big, better community. Great. Nicole and then Tracy. So, I mean, I would say right now I'm in rehearsal for a Shakespeare production called The Taming of the Shrew. Um, and so for me, one of the most exciting things about what we get to do as professional theater artists is we get to create something um, out of thin air. And sometimes it's a new play and sometimes it's a really old play that's 400 years old by, by William Shakespeare. And we get to breathe new life into an old text. So. I think it's it's the freedom, it's the creativity, it's thinking about all of the design elements, it's working in a really collaborative creative process um, with actors and designers. Um, and I would say one of the challenges uh, of, the, of the job is casting. Um, because sometimes, it, you know, South Florida has a pretty um, rich and diverse um, professional acting community, but sometimes it's not New York. And so sometimes we, we struggle um, with finding just the right um, actor. And also theater is live. And so, you know, and we are human. And so sometimes people get sick 
there, you know, a car breaks down uh, and understudies have to go on. So that, th that is an aspect of uh, working in the performing arts that is more stressful. Tracy. So for me, um, my favorite part of what I do, I work with kids. So through Honey Shine and the Overtown Youth Center, I love that I have summer camp as my job. Like I spend time at summer camp where, you know, we're doing all kinds of activities, fun things, including STEM So and STEAM. So it's really exciting to see that with our girls. I can say that that hasn't always been the case. Our summer camp now is thick over six weeks long, uh, but we started out one week uh, long at Carrollton in Coconut Grove, and that's been our home ever since over 20 years ago. Um, but I remember coming home that first day from camp with all those teenage girls. And I just went, I came home, I cried. I was like, I'm not going back. Like, I, I can't do this. Like, I was like, God, are you sure you don't want me on a beach somewhere? It's summertime. You know, I know that's what you want for me. And the next day when I went back into camp, I had a honey bug. Uh, that's what we refer to our girls as run up to me and hug me and said, Miss Tracy, I told God, thank you for honey shine. So it was like, oh, okay, God, you know, so I, I, okay, I, this is where I'm supposed to be. And I love it. I truly I love spending time with the kids uh, that, that interaction with them. That's the best part of it. And my least favorite part of that um is the fundraising, the asking for money. I don't like that part, but I know it's necessary because we need lots of funds because we're taking care of and servicing a lot of children and families. So the more you serve and the, 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 more, uh, the bigger your community gets, the more money you have to raise. So I've gotten better at that. And I know that's a part of the job. So that's my least favorite with that. And when it comes to designing uh, my collection, I have a collection called Love, Living on Vacation Every Day. I'm a believer in the power of words and thoughts. Um, so my favorite uh, aspect of that is the creating part. I, I love uh, that aspect of it. Um, uh, and there's not really much that I don't like about that. So, yes. Thank you. So we're almost at time. So I have one final question for you all, and I, I'm giving you all a minute each to answer it, is advice. What advice do you have to young women, to teachers, parents, to inspire girls to lead and, and become their fullest potential? And we'll go around the Zoom square. So I'm gonna start with Brittany. So um, I don't know if it's necessarily advice, but the my personal philosophy, the words that I live by every single day is that nobody accomplishes anything alone and you are only as good as people that you surround yourself with. Be very intentional about who you choose to surround yourself with. Um, they are going to, I, I truly believe can make or break you. And you want to make sure that you have the most incredible group of individuals around you that are gonna lift you up and support you every single day. Um, and remember that you you can't do it all alone and to make sure that you always give that credit back where it's due. I couldn't do what I do without the support of an amazing team of individuals, an incredible board of governors, the entire community has really rallied behind me and I'm so grateful. So I get to, I you know have a little bit of chip on my shoulder because I get to stand here and, and be the face of the organization. But I know that when it boils down to it, my team is amazing. My board's amazing. Our members are amazing. And I am, I am successful because of them. So always show that gratitude back. Thank you, Brittany. Heidi. My advice is work hard and follow your heart. And this ties back to the shy question from earlier. Uh, as I mentioned before, when it's something that you really believe in, then it motivates you. And so when things get hard or when, um, you know, you feel like you're being discriminated against or you're running into a brick wall and, and you don't feel like you're getting to where you need to go, that dream that you have inside of you is going to motivate you to keep trying and it's going to give you your voice so that you have the confidence to go out and ask for what you deserve and to be who it is that you're meant to be. So um, always channel that inner strength and give it your best and you're going to have a great life. Thank you. Tracy. 
You know, I echo uh, what everyone else has said. For, uh, again, thank you all for uh, having uh, us here and having me here. But, you know, my mother was my greatest teacher, even as a teenager. I, even though I didn't think so when I was a teenager, um, the smartest woman I know. And she would always say, you know, giving up's not an option. And don't look back. You only get dust in your eyes. And I have found that to be the, the case. And we moved out of South Florida when I was a little girl because I used to live here when I was a little girl. And she would always say, Tracy, if they can keep you uneducated, they can control you. And I never knew what that was or who they were until I had children of my own um, and, and started doing the work in the community. But giving up is not an option. And I am very clear. Uh, I have had the greatest mom in the world, the most amazing children, friends. But my relationship with God and, and knowing that that is my source and, and everything, I'm telling you that prayer works. So when it gets tough, when it gets hard, um, you don't look back. Just keep going forward. And it, when God places something on your heart, a vision, a dream, something you want to do, you're going to have challenges. It's going to take work. And um, you may have moments where you want to give up, but please just keep going uh, and, and never surrender um, uh, to anyone or anything except God. That's my advice. Tracy, Nicole. You're muted. Yep. Um, I have a short list for you. So I would say follow your interests, right? This, this magical word passion, there's something to it. Um, so follow your interests and, and know your strengths. Um, ask questions, do research, read, 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 and educate yourself. Um, take chances and also find your role models because role models I think are hugely important and they can be celebrities. They can be P parents and family members, but um, figure out who the people are in your world or, or yet unknown to you through all that research and reading that you're going to do, um, who can help inspire you and, and show you that we are always building on um, the work of people that have come before us. Thank you, Nicole. And thank you to all the women on the panel today. We are at time um, and I just want to say that on behalf of Miami Children's Museum, we appreciate the four of you being here and sharing with all of our viewers. Um, this conversation will live on YouTube so we can uh, share it with more and more young women and young men as we discussed. Um, and hopefully we will encourage some, um, some young girls to shatter the glass ceiling uh, in their lifetime. Uh, so thank you everybody for joining in. This has been our quarterly conversation, Breaking the Glass Ceiling, Inspiring Girls to Lead. Thank you, Brittany, Heidi, Tracy, and Nicole. And thank you to all those tuning in. We hope that you got something out of it. And until next time, we hope that you all have a lovely, wonderful day. Take care, everybody.